Hey, Klaus here. Welcome to episode 130 of the e-commerce Coffee Break podcast. Today, I have Blake Hutchinson, CEO of Flipper.com on the show, and we talk about his experience in buying, selling domains, including other digital assets. We will find out how to successfully invest in this space and what you need to know before buying a new website. So let's get into it. This is the e-commerce coffee break, the podcast dedicated to Shopify store owners who want to optimize their business for maximum conversions and revenue. Each week, you're going to get actionable advice and hear from special guests talking about various topics on how to run a profitable business on Shopify. Learn how to survive in the fast-changing e-commerce world with your host, Klaus Lauter, and get e-commerce insights you can't Google. Welcome to the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of the e-commerce coffee break. A lot of Shopify merchants always think about making money with their store. They put all the work and sweat and tears in there to grow it. And then at some point they might think on selling their business. Now, the most important asset in the business is actually the website to store. And a lot of merchants struggle to find ways or think about what's the best way to find a buyer there. So there's a very good way. And I want to dive into this topic a little bit deeper today. And therefore I have Blake Hutchinson with me. He is the CEO of Flipper.com. Flipper.com is the world's largest marketplace to buy and sell online businesses. Blake leads a team as they build out a product empowering exit and ownership for business owners and entrepreneurs globally. Prior to running Flipper, Blake held leadership roles across multiple fast growth tech businesses across e-commerce and SaaS businesses. Hi, Blake. How are you today? Good, Klaus. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. Blake, building a digital asset, not easy. And once you have grown it to a certain size, one might think on how to sell it. That's what you're doing for a living. Give me a bit of a background on how this kind of market has evolved over the last couple of years. It's evolved a lot. We see higher value assets now, and that's really a function of how the industry, e-commerce, as well as the digital economy more broadly has evolved and matured. I think you and I both know that it was maturing, evolving and growing far before the COVID-19 pandemic. So that had some impact, of course, mainly around people's awareness for digital and the power of digital for shopping. But in many respects, online business ownership was thriving prior to that point. What I would say is that as a function of how the digital economy grows, there's also a greater appreciation for the work that digital entrepreneurs put into their businesses. And so as a result, um, smart, savvy investors and acquirers are looking at this particular asset class as an asset class. For a long time, we might consider someone who is building an e-commerce store or a blog or an app to almost be hobby entrepreneurs. But in many respects, they are now classified as legitimate high quality business owners as they should have always been classified, but now more than ever before as a result of a group and network of investors around the world looking to acquire online businesses as part of a portfolio strategy or as part of an asset and diversity of asset mix. There's greater clarity around the power of what people are building. And as a result, the valuations are creeping up as well. So I'd say it's evolved around the value, but also the sophistication of the people involved. If it comes to a digital asset, as you already mentioned, there is more than just a website. It can be an app. It can be a social channel. There's a lot of different ways that fall in brackets a digital real estate. Now, what's the best way to build up your asset and to bring it to a point where somebody would be interested to buy it? Yeah, great question. Most buyers are interested in something which has matured. Younger assets are less well-valued and more mature assets are in greater demand. So the average asset that sells on Flipper is actually four and a half years old. And so that's something for people to consider, that longevity is an indication of quality. The second thing to consider is consistency of performance. Unlike the startup world, you're not necessarily going to be sitting on top of a rocket ship. What business buyers are looking for is consistency of performance. And so if for the last year, and I'm being a bit simple in my language, but if for the last year you've been doing $20,000 every month with a little bit of fluctuation, 10% either side, and clear evidence that you can manage a consistently performing business in a profitable manner, that will be very, very, very attractive to a lot of people. Because what I'm taking over is 
an asset and I believe that my asset needs predictability. And so if the performance is speculative, if it is highly subject to seasonality or some niche or fad or trend, it's less likely to command the attention of a buyer. So contemplate that. As it relates to growth, Growth is really, really important, but it has to be sustainable growth. If you are spending money on Facebook to grow your business, but you want to achieve not only for the sustainable operations of your business, but also for the ultimate value when you do go to sell it, you want to be able to show sustainability. And so if you can achieve three, four, five times ROAS on Facebook, great. But Continue to do that and show consistency around that effort. If you have a social channel and that social channel is clearly demonstrating engagement with your business and you can attribute that back to revenue, that's great. If you can't show that it contributes revenue, whilst it's cool, it's not likely to add great amounts of value on a multiple basis. So if an asset is worth three times net profit multiple, it's less likely that you can say, hey, but I've got 100,000 Instagram followers. So give me five times. It's not valued that way. They tend to love opportunity, buyers do, but they don't tend to pay for opportunity. They pay for performance. So if your social media channels create revenue for you, wonderful. If they don't create revenue for you, that's a great opportunity for growth. You should be looking at your social channels and how you can actually attribute revenue to those social channels. And so therefore, you need to have a good understanding of your attribution model. So hopefully that provides you some context. Lots of ways to grow, but a function of the way people assess a business is its predictability and its ongoing returns. Yeah, I think that's a very good overview. And it always makes me smile if I see in Facebook some guys trying to sell a dropshipping store that's six months old and asking for some hilarious prices there. So obviously, you need to be a bit longer in business to become a sellable asset. I want to go a little bit more into the KPIs. What are the numbers, the figures, the stats that a potential buyer is looking for? Great question. So first and foremost, buyers do look for profitable assets. And so let's just define profitability in its most basic terms. We're looking at net profit numbers here. So that is basically, with the exception of what you might pay yourself, which we can remove from the profit and loss statement for the purposes of understanding the true performance of the business, they are looking at revenue minus expenses equals more than $1. They're looking for profitable assets. And that's because because they are buying them as an investment. So I'm either buying them, buying an asset because I want it to be my next job. So it has to pay me a salary, which means it must be profitable. Or I'm buying an asset because I believe it complements an existing portfolio strategy that I have, in which case I'm a seasoned acquisition entrepreneur. Or I'm buying an asset because I'm an institutional investor and I buy a blog that's got lots of traffic that's profitable on AdSense, but I believe that if I deploy my own ad sales team, I can pace AdSense and therefore get a greater return on investment. So the first answer to your question is I'm looking at profitability. Clearly, I also look at operational costs. If you have a very expensive way of producing content, that's good to disclose actually, because it shows that there's not only Quality is a factor of performance, but it could also give buyers an impression of ways to optimize cost and potentially reduce cost. So it's a really good thing to be transparent and you don't know which way a buyer will perceive that. The other thing is traffic and the way in which you acquire that traffic. So buyers will always put a greater emphasis on organic and direct traffic. And the reason being is it's more profitable traffic typically. That's not to say that a good e-commerce operator will dismiss something that spends money to make money. Of course not. If you can actually prove over time that you're less reliant on huge amounts of ad spend because you've got strong repeat purchase, a low refund rate, and a high AOV, average order value, those are things which are going to appeal. Buyers love high average order value. It appeals to the unit economics. So anyone who has a unit economics framework for assessing the quality of a business, they will love a high AOV business because it tends to mean there's enough money left over to pay everyone and afford to acquire new customers. That's a very broad way of answering your question. Okay. Now, selling a digital asset, digital real estate, it's like selling a house. It's not only the house, there's a lot of things that come with it. Now, for a digital asset, you're not selling only a domain, which I think a lot of people think when you're selling something. So there's a lot of other moving parts in there. What do you need to think about or what would be the package in a perfect world scenario that a buyer is interested in? Anything that they believe derives value for the business. So let's go through those things. The domain, certainly yes. The brand, yes. The reputation. So that is the history the customer database, all of the data and analytics around that customer database. The historical trading revenue is acquired 
so that they can continue to farm that existing incumbent user base. All the brand assets, the social media accounts, and the followings. As a result, if there is anything proprietary, they will be acquiring that too. If it's dropship, there's often not anything proprietary, but in that case, they might be acquiring the supplier contracts you have. If there's something proprietary like the designs, perhaps you put unique designs on t-shirts, they are acquiring the designs. And that is factored in as an asset that needs to be transferred to the owner at the point of sale. Anything that they determine to derive value for the business will be listed in the contract of sale or the asset purchase agreement and is typically transferred at the point at which the escrow release happens. Okay. So I think it already shows our listeners and viewers that selling a digital asset is not just a PayPal payment. There is much more to it. And we're coming into the realm of business and law and all of these things and contracting. Now, a flipper.com is the largest marketplace worldwide to buy and sell online businesses. How do you guys help both sides, the buyer and the seller, with going through this process? Great question. So the first thing we do is help sellers to understand the value of their assets. And that's a really important piece. So we have a proprietary valuation tool. You can find that at flipper.com. And that is backed by not only machine learning, but also the historical sales data that determines the value of any given business model, SaaS, e-commerce, content, content backed by AdSense versus content backed by Amazon Associates, et cetera. There's lots of different variables that go in. Age is a variable, profitability is a variable, all that goes into the model. And then that gets smarter as we sell more assets and learn more about the industry and the marketplace. The second thing that happens is we make listing and showing the objective performance of your business simple with our data integrations. So we Connect directly to QuickBooks Online, Xero, Shopify, Stripe, BigCommerce, Magento, Amazon, WooCommerce. We connect to all of those. And so when you log in to create your listing, you connect your data source, we pull down the data and we make therefore presenting your listing a little easier. But then to finish the answer to the question, we then provide that data to the buyers so that they can make an informed decision as to the quality of the asset. We then build market insights around. So we'll show buyers how that asset performs against its peer set. So if it's an e-commerce asset, we will expose the refund rate of the asset in question, but we'll also expose how that refund rate compares to other assets like that one. And that is available on the listing page. Once a buyer decides that they're interested, we obviously have an inbuilt, what we call deal room, where buyers and sellers can communicate with each other and negotiate. For higher value assets, we also provide a flipper advisor. They are there to operate as a representative for the seller and sell the asset to our respective buyer base. We have due diligence services. We have inbuilt legal templates plus access to lawyers in the event of something more sophisticated. But we have a bunch of other seller services and buyer services that ensure that the asset transfer process happens smoothly and including integrated escrow, trust accounts, the ability to pay with cryptocurrency if you would like. So we are not only a marketplace, we're more like a market network. We facilitate all of the different services that are required to ensure the marketplace operates seamlessly. Okay. I already see it's a relatively complex process. Two questions there. First of all, where do you earn your money on? So where I'm going with that as a question, who's your perfect customer? So if I'm selling my first 50 products on Shopify, probably not. So who's your perfect avatar? Yeah, so Flipper makes its money for success fees. So we're looking for really high quality businesses because we know that high quality businesses sell. The quality question comes down to age, profitability, revenue mix, and obviously, you know, how you acquire your customers, organic, direct, or, or social, paid marketing, et cetera. We do make a little bit of money from listing fees, but it's quite trivial from our perspective. It's most of our revenue, 85% of our revenue is derived from success phase. Perfect customer for us is not necessarily Shopify. It's any online business that has been around for two years or longer, which is cash flow generating, which is profit and shows consistency of performance. As long as they are built on top of the platform economy, platforms that help you grow businesses, Shopify, Amazon, WordPress, AdSense, Analytics, all those, as long as they are digital by nature, have shown a history of performance, they're a good custom for us. Whether they are big or not doesn't matter to us. We are a marketplace. We are price agnostic. So you can sell a beautiful quality business for $25,000 and you can sell a beautiful quality business for $25 million. So long as you have the revenue and the profitability to justify those multiples and those price points, you're a good fit for Flip. Okay. What's the average time for a sale on Flipper? 3.24 months. The only reason I know that is because we just ran some data on 
done it like literally yesterday. So thank you for asking the question. So really, really high quality assets that are very much organic traffic driven will sell very quickly, like literally days, sometimes weeks. A more traditional online business, take a Shopify store in the fashion industry running at a 2.5 times row asset has been doing consistently for the last two years. That's going to take a more traditional period of call it 3.24 months. Okay. Thanks for this very accurate number. Before we come to the end of our coffee break today, one question I will have is what's the biggest arrow that you see that people are making when they build their digital asset? So there's two big things. One is they don't actually understand the finances around how their business operates and they're not tracking their performance and rigorously analyzing it day to day. And probably the second thing is that they're often trying to do too much. And so we often see e-commerce stores, for instance, which have three or four SKUs making 80% of the revenue and then another 50 SKUs making very little. And you actually drill down into what's working for you and just orientate most of your attention there. Because if you don't want to exit, fine, do whatever you want. But if you're actually trying to set yourself up to have a long-term sustainable business that somebody else may actually want to acquire from you, you're actually better off having fewer focuses and better performance. Okay. Thanks for highlighting the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. I'm a big fan for that. And I'm always preaching that to my clients and bringing this up in front. And you see there it works as well. Like, where can people find more about you and Flipper.com? I'm mainly a LinkedIn user versus any other social platform. So certainly find me on LinkedIn, connect with me, send me a comment or a note or respond if you heard me here. Certainly Flipper.com, get a free online business valuation. Only takes a couple of minutes. Might help you out. Otherwise, keep in touch with us via the usual social media. We're doing a lot right now. So there's a lot of change happening and hopefully that inspires people. Cool. Thanks so much. I will put the links in the show notes then you just one click away. Blake, I think that was a very good insight on how to build, sell or buy a, a digital asset and should show anyone how this process works and that it's not a simple process and you need to put some time and work into to make it work. Thanks so much again. Thank you, Klaus. Hey, Klaus here. Before you go, I would like to invite you to become part of the e-commerce merchant pro community to get actionable advice from other Shopify merchants who already have achieved what you are aiming for. Our community is a safe place to actively grow your online retail business with the support of the most amazing and helpful group of e-commerce entrepreneurs behind you. Running a Shopify business is tough. Don't do it alone. Join us now. It's free. You will find the link in the show notes. Also, if you think your online store has conversion or marketing issues and you would like to have a fresh set of eyes on your business, then drop me an email at klaus at klauslauter.com and let me know a little bit about your business. It might be beneficial for you to have me look over your store, offers, emails and ads and get an unbiased outside perspective and guidance to help you make most of your online business. And finally, if you enjoy the show, please rate and review in the app that you're listening so that I can get bigger and more impactful guests on the podcast. Thank you as always for tuning in today. I appreciate you. Until next time, and I talk to you soon.